All righty. All ready to go. Sandy and Linda, did you get uh, Dan and uh, Ron off of all their... Uh, he's not even listening over there. Seeing all of what he's done for his uh, President's Day shopping, I know that must be exhausted. I just have a little thing for you. A uh, man dies and he goes to heaven. Well, he meets St. Peter at the gates and St. Peter gets out his clipboard and says, well, that's how it works. You need 100 points to make it into heaven. If you can tell me all the good things that you've done, I'll write down on here and tell you how many points you get. And when you reach 100, you get into heaven. The guy says, okay. Let's see. I was married 50 years to the same woman, and I never cheated on her once, not even in my heart. St. Peter says, fantastic. Three points. The guy goes, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I attended church every day in my life, or every week, and uh, I did, helped with all the ministries through tithing and uh, doing service. St. Peter goes, awesome, one point. Ooh, one point, golly. Uh, well, how about this? I started a soup kitchen in my town, and also I uh, worked for a shelter for homeless veterans. St. Peter says, fantastic, two points. Whoa, two points. Man, there's 94 more points to go. At this rate, only way I'm going to get to heaven is by the grace of God. And Peter says, come on in. <laughs> so, let's, first song is Marvelous Grace. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, that awesome grace. Yep, it doesn't uh, take points to get into heaven. Is it good to do service for our fellow men? You bet. But it's just through the grace of Jesus Christ, having that relationship with him, that bridges us to our Heavenly Father. And Lord, that uh, we have the time here to worship you, Lord, and uh, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. And that uh, we are sinners and that we need to uh, um, come to you, Lord, when we're struggling. But also to keep that relationship when things are going great. And that, that we continue to uh, listen and, and today that we listen to the parables that Ozzy will be talking about. And that we, that we can relate, that we can have that relationship with you. In his precious name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome the ones that uh, may be visiting the church, and we're glad to see you here. And uh, uh, some announcements. Had a note here from uh, Don and Sharon Fry. They want to thank you for all the prayers and cards, and for uh, sharing your love uh, with them. Don was there having some uh, heart issues. He has a little electronic thing he's showing me. Uh, Don, you ready for a foot race? Um, also be looking into your um, program. Of course, there's uh, all the prayer requests there. Um, we always talk about, you know, if you have a course of prayer request, uh, send it to Ozzy. But also, if uh, some of you are not on the prayer chain as far as getting the info, like on the emails and stuff, uh, tell Ozzy. And if you have an email address, um, he'll send it to you. And that way you can be uh, helping the, the rest, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, the ones that may be needing prayer for um, whatever issues. And so be uh, thinking about that. <clears throat> also, a uh, month of calendar, I will uh, get uh, one for March uh, up. And... Uh, and uh, that should be here uh, next uh, Sunday. Um, we go to birthdays. Um, looks like we have some uh, late babies, I uh, call them. They have 29 slash 1 on the, on the uh, calendar. But uh, Steve Davis and Marietta Hammer celebrates, I guess, either on the 28th or the 1st. Um, since we don't have a, a, sip, or a February 29th. And uh, Jim Gardner on the 1st. Um, that's all I have. Anybody think anything else that I may have missed? All right. Guess we're here to worship. All right, ladies.
Good morning. Do you ever stop and really think about those lyrics on the songs we sing? I had one with an earworm this week going around and around in my head until I really stopped to think about it. It's a simple phrasing, but the depth of the truths that are in some of those songs, altogether worthy, altogether lovely, are we blessed or what? So as we come to this time of communion, we all approach the altar with a different heart. Some of us have had a great week and we come rejoicing, while others carry heavy burdens. Or many may have a heart of despair because of current world events. We all know people who are hard-hearted, others we would describe as soft-hearted, some describe as having no heart at all. In this body of believers, there are those who think they are young at heart. However, we can look at the person sitting next to us and know that their heart is actually 60 or 70 or 80 plus years old. In fact, we can't know one another's heart. What we do know is God wants all of us, regardless of age, life experiences, to come around the altar of the Lord with a heart that is moldable, to come with a heart of a child. If you've forgotten what it's like to have the heart of a child, you need to look no further than little J.J. Osborne as he scampers through the congregation. He is in the present. He is right now. He is just happy as a lark. As we join together in participation of the bread and the cup, which represent the body that was given, the blood that was shed of our Lord Jesus Christ, go back in your mind and rediscover the heart of your childhood in that aspect. Mark wrote, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, that open, loving, accepting heart. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter
forgot to tell you that scripture reading which was Mark 10, 13 through 16, out of the NIV. Will you pray with me? Father, as we come before your altar at this time, joyously, Father, that we can eat of the bread and drink of the cup that represents your body and your blood. Father God, that you would subject yourself to your own creation unto a death on the cross for our salvation, the created beings that you have made. Just thank you, Father. Bless us now as we take, partake of this act. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning, everybody. Are we on? Testing, one, two, three, testing. Can you hear me now? Very good, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And welcome once again to Christ Church of the Valley. It's so good to look out here and see so many people. I'm so, I, you know, things just got going this morning that I didn't get to say good morning to so many of you. And you know that I love to stand there and greet you and say hi to you, if nothing else, you know, it gets chat and visit. So uh, we'll, we'll have to talk after church. Sound good? Um, so we are going to continue this morning our study of the parables. And if you have been following me in the parables or you've been reading in the Gospels, you may have noticed there was a little bit of arbitrary selection by starting in Matthew 13. Because Jesus had already told parables before Jesus 13. So why did I choose to jump on in at Matthew 13? Well, that's a very good question. Good asking. Uh, on top of that, uh, one of the things you see in Matthew 13 is Jesus unpacking his parables for us. And I wanted to start there because I wanted to see what Jesus does with his parables. How does he unpack them? And then we could go back and look at some of his other parables. And I think we see some very important things when we look at Jesus present a parable and then Jesus interpret the parable. And what we're going to do is take that, that formula or that system that Jesus has there and then we're going to apply them to previous parables. Does that make sense? I hope it does. With that, we're going to touch on a parable today. Actually, we're just going to immerse ourselves in this parable. And there's, 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 there's a popular interpretation of this parable and that popular interpretation of that parable is wrong. And I say that humbly because it's based on a false premise. And the false premise is they didn't listen to Jesus. Jesus told them how to interpret the parable, and they didn't listen to him. And this is in one of the most popular commentaries of the last 100 years. Four very smart Bible people took this parable and went in the wrong direction. And that's affected how this parable has gone out into the church. I worked as a short order cook once at a, a restaurant. I was mostly on the, the breakfast, the lunch shifts. Uh, in fact, I don't remember working a single dinner ever at that restaurant. And uh, one morning I come in, have to be there early before the customers get their set up, get the eggs out, turn on the, the uh, grills and so forth, open up the refrigerator door, look on the shelf, and here is one of the formerly frozen chicken patties, fried chicken patties, and it's sliced, and it's sitting on a plate in the refrigerator. Well, that's weird. We usually don't do that. What's, what's the story with that? Come to find out, a, a fellow had started the night before. Uh, it was his first shift. We can forgive, can't we? Uh, he had gotten an order for chicken fingers, he assumed you take a chicken patty and you just slice it. But I wondered if he had ever had a chicken finger because the breading tends to go the whole way around the chicken finger. And when you slice it, now you have open... What did he have in mind? He had a, he had a false premise. That's what, that's what it was. And um, I don't know why they put it in the refrigerator and didn't just throw it away. It eventually got thrown away because if you looked at it, it had gone into the fryer with, with it being cut and now it didn't look like something you wanted to eat. So it eventually got thrown away. Uh, let's go ahead and start with this parable. This is the parable of the, the wheat in the tares or the wheat in the weeds. This is Matthew chapter 13. We're going to begin in verse 24. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. And Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be comparable to a man who sowed good seed in his field. While his men were sleeping, 
his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares also became evident. The slaves of that landowner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Why then are there tares, or how then are there tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said to them, No, while you are gathering the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them, allow them both to grow until the harvest. And in, in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares, bind them and burn them up, uh, then gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this actually happened enough in the ancient world. Farmers competing with other farmers, they resorted to sabotage sometimes to try and make sure their crop was the one that sold at the market and they made all the money that they would actually stoop to this level. They did it so often that Rome actually made a law forbidding this. Now, I would have never thought of that, but then again, I'm not a farmer and I've never farmed. So I, it makes sense that I would have never thought of this. But, now that's a, that's a blatant thing to even have a Roman law telling you don't do this and for this enemy to still be willing to go and do this, knowing that he could, if he got caught, face punishment. Huh. Uh, the the uh, weeds or this terrors that they think... They think that this is a type of weed called zizania. And I'm not positive that I'm pronouncing that right. But zizania and wheat look almost identical as they grow until it's time for the, uh, the, the, the uh, seed to show up or, or, you know, on the plant. And then it becomes very evident that you have some wheat and some weeds. But one of the things that's happened as they've been growing together is actually their roots underneath the soil have been intertangling. The slaves say to him, do you want us to go in and weed your field? And he says, no, because as you tear up the tares, you're going to uproot the wheat. And you see why they would uproot the wheat as they tore up the tares, right? Let's jump down to Jesus' explanation of this. So we're still in Matthew 13. We're going to pick it up in verse uh, 36. Excuse me. <clears throat> then he left the crowd and went to the house, and his disciples came with him and said, Explain to us the parable of the terrors of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed, he is the son of man. Now you know if you've been in Matthew, son of man is one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. But son of man is going to be very important in this parable. We'll unpack that when we get to it, okay? Uh, verse 38, and the field is the world. Did you see that Jesus said that? The field is the world. What's the field? The world. The field is not the church. Okay? The field is the world. People have taken this parable and said the field is the church. And inside of the church, you're going to have weeds and wheat. You're going to have true Christians and you're going to have false quit Christians. And where that may or may not be true... That's not Jesus' point. And if you take Jesus' point out and you apply this simply to the church, you're going to miss Jesus' point. Very important. Jesus interpreted it for us. So now we know the field is the world. Agreed? A few more head nods and we can move on. Uh, so still in verse 38. The field is the world. And as for the good seed, they are the sons of the kingdom. They are the sons of the kingdom, not the subjects of the kingdom. They are the sons of the kingdom. And the terrors, they are the sons of the evil one. And the evil one, or the enemy, verse 39, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and, uh, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. 
and will throw them into uh, furnaces of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now the reason that I stopped halfway through that reading to focus, to get us to see what Jesus is saying, is because that interpretation that this parable is about the church is such a popular interpretation. And where I'm not going to debate you that within the visible church there might be true Christians and there might be false Christians, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Instead, Jesus is talking about the whole wide world. And within the whole wide world, even with the church present, even with the kingdom present, there's still going to be weeds and wheat. And that's something that we have to understand as we, the church, continue to be in the world. Because we haven't been taken out of the world. We're still in the world. That's, uh, that's one of those things. <sighs> We see the devil again in this parable, don't we? We've seen him before. He was in the parable of the, the, the four soils. And you'll remember the seed that fell along the path. And the birds of the air came and eat it up. He said that's the devil coming along and snatching, snatching, away, from, snatching away from them the word of God. And here we see the devil once again coming in and trying to disrupt what the Son of Man is doing. That's something you and I need to always be conscious of. That's something we need to be aware of. The devil is going to try every chance he gets to disrupt whatever the Son of God is doing. We need to be aware of that. We need to be looking for that. But, one of the things I want you to see as Jesus interprets this, the, the interpretation actually breaks down very easily, and it comes through in the English. I love this. This is one of those times we don't have to go to the Greek. The English actually carries this. If you look, starting in verse 37 and going to verse 39, he has a, this is that, this is that. So the, the son of man the, is the one who sows the good seed. The field is the world. The good seed are the, the, the sons of the kingdom. The wheat, or, or excuse me, the weeds, the tares, are the sons of the evil ones. So we have a one-to-one -one ratio with quite a few things in this parable. But not everything has a one-to-one -one ratio. You'll notice that in the parable there's the slaves or the servants. You'll notice they're not brought up again in the interpretation. You'll notice that when does, when does the enemy come and, and sow the, the, second, the second seeds? When, when does that happen? When they're asleep. When they're asleep. You'll notice that that night or sleep is never brought up in the interpretation. So not everything, not every item, every person, everything in the parable will have a one-to-one -one ratio in the interpretation. I think that's a very important thing to see as Jesus unpacks this, especially as we look back and look forward to other parables. Now with that, though, how many of you read this parable and go, uh, this is a bit of a scary parable? Because it's talking about the final judgment. It's talking about the reality of the final judgment. I told you before, there's certain things of Jesus, there's certain ways to present Jesus, there's certain, certain parts of Jesus that you can say, and you're going to get no pushback from the world. You're really not. When Jesus says, be nice to people. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek. You're not going to get a lot of people coming to you and saying, you know, that Jesus, I don't know about him. Those kinds of things the world likes, right? But when Jesus talks about the final judgment, we don't want none of that. That's not welcome. But this comes straight out of the mouth of Jesus. So it's something to take seriously, isn't it? Not that anything else in the scripture, just because it may not have come out of the mouth of Jesus, not to give you a pass on that, but when Jesus talks about it, 
It's an important thing to see, isn't it? And there's a sad reality. And I say that, and I mean that, that there is a sad reality that at the harvest there will be weeds. And my heart breaks for that. Does your heart break for that? Are you afraid that you might know some weeds? That's a horrible way to think about somebody, isn't it? But that's a a reality that we have to face, a reality that we have to struggle with. I told you that this comes through in the English. You'll notice from verse 37 to verse 39, everything is in the present tense. But then starting in verse 40, it's in the future tense. And that's because the judgment is, of course, at the end of the ages, right? If you don't know in ASL, this is future. That's why I always do it whenever I talk about the future. This is a sad reality, but it actually does fit with the other parables, doesn't it? Because in the other parables, there was that little bit of what kind of soil is my heart? Is my heart good soil? Or is my heart rocky soil? Or is my, my heart, is it infested with weeds or thorns that's going to choke out? There is that in the, that parable, isn't there? Well, here too, there's that question that I think every listener of Jesus back in the first century and every listener to the gospel throughout the church age has, has been meant to ask. Am I wheat or am I weeds? Does my life reflect wheat or does my life reflect weeds? Boy, in Colorado, that takes on a different meaning, doesn't it? Oh, come on, you guys can laugh. Thank you. I focused there for a second, pointing out that Jesus mentions the Son of Man. And I'm going to suggest to you that Daniel 7, Daniel chapter 7, is the text that Jesus has in mind as he presents this parable to them. And you might wonder, why do you think Daniel chapter 7 is standing behind this this text? Well, first of all, there's the allusion to the Son of Man, and in Daniel chapter 7, verses uh, 14 and, uh, excuse me, verses 13 and 14, the chairs are set up, the Ancient of Days takes his throne, and one like a Son of Man comes. And that one like a Son of Man is given authority. Look at what happens here in in this. The Son of Man, this is verse 41, the Son of Man sends forth His angels. He has the authority to send forth the angels to do this judgment. I think that there's also Revelation chapter 11, verse verse 15, standing behind this. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 is the seventh trumpet. And at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the kingdom, singular, the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And you'll notice that when the Son of Man sends His angels out, what do they do? They gather out of His kingdom. Halfway through the parable, the field is no longer the world. It's now the kingdom of the Son of Man. That's why I think Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 11 are standing behind. Well, that's not, that's not the right way to say it since Revelation 11 isn't written by the time that Jesus is saying that. But with hindsight, we can see that. Just a few more things, just in case Daniel isn't standing behind him. What, what happens to the weeds? The weeds are thrown into a fiery furnace. That comes right out of that language comes right out of Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refuse to bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Where are they thrown? The fiery furnace. Also, Jesus ends this parable with the righteous will shine forth like the sun. That's, that's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Those who rise, who are king, who are part of the kingdom, they will shine like the sun. So that's why I think Daniel is standing behind this. Boy, this is not one of those happy passages. Now, we can focus on what happens to the sons of the kingdom, 
But it's a grim reality that the final judgment is a reality. That's not a popular thing in our world today, is it? The idea that you're going to be judged. The idea that judgment is coming. It's a popular idea that all roads lead to God. That's a popular thing out in our society, out in our world today. May I suggest they're not wrong, but all roads lead to God. Most of them lead to God as judge, and only the road of Christ leads to God as Father. Make sense? Now, from here on, Jesus is always happy Jesus. He's always friend Jesus. No, no more of this judgment Jesus, right? Wrong. Let's, uh, let's jump down. We'll be in, uh, still in Matthew 13 and uh, verse 47. We get the parable of the dragnet or the, the fish in, in the net. Uh, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. Verse 48. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad fish they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and will take out the wicked from amongst the righteous and will throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable has so much in common with the parable of the weeds and the wheat, doesn't it? We see that separation, the, the righteous from the wicked. We also see the angels playing a role in that. I think that that's an important thing to see, that in the parable of the weeds and the wheat, the angels are the ones that separate the weeds from the wheat. Here, it's the angels that are separating the, the, the good fish from the bad fish. And it, it's not hard to understand the good fish from the bad fish from a first century Jewish perspective, is it? So when they would cast this net, this particular net, if you've ever watched those films where one guy takes a net and throws it, have you seen those films? And it it's, it's, uh, spans out and then they, they pull it up. This isn't that kind of net. Instead, this is the kind of net that you have two fishing boats and you have partners and you both throw out the net. So it's thrown out from two different boats. And then it's gathered in onto the sea. So we're talking about a huge net. And inside the Sea of Galilee, there's going to be both kosher fish and non-kosher sea life and fish. And the first century Jew, he's going to, first of all, separate those things. Because he wants to find the fish that he could feed his family. Or he wants to find the fish that he could sell in the Jewish market. To get an unclean fish isn't going to do him any good, so he's just going to throw it away. You see that in the parable, don't you? So that's what's going on there. But what I want you to see from both of these parables is that it's the angels doing it. You'll remember in the first parable, the servants, the slaves, come to him and say, do you want us to weed the field? And the Son of Man says, no, I'll take care of it at the end of the age. One of the good things, one of the, one of the things we've got to see is at the final judgment, I'm not going to be the one sitting on the judge throne. You're not going to be the one sitting on the judge throne. Who's going to be sitting on the judge throne? God. Jesus. We see there that it's not going to be Ozzy's opinion, your opinion, his opinion, her opinion. It's going to be God's opinion that matters most on that day. How many of you breathe a sigh of relief that you're not the judge? I, I tell you, I, I have to breathe a sigh of relief that I'm not the judge. I don't want to be the judge. We again, though, see this tragedy, this real tragedy, this real heartbreaking moment that the final judgment is coming. And unfortunately, there's going to be weeds, or excuse me, there's going to be wheat and weeds. At the final judgment, there's going to be good fish and there's going to be bad fish. People, I, I shared this with you last year when I preached on hell. Uh, I believe in the reality of hell. I believe in the literal place of hell. It's not a subject that brings me any delight that hell is a real place, that people suffer 
That's a very tragic, that's a very sad thing. We've sang so many songs this morning about grace. The grace of God is available. The grace of God is wide and reaching. And I love Brett's opening, that's how you get into heaven. No point system. No how many good things have you ever done? How many bad things have you ever done? Which side will weigh more? How much does a bad thing weigh? How much does a good thing weigh? We don't have to worry about that, huh? Because of the grace of God. Because of the gospel message that goes out. And you've responded to the gospel message. Don't you want everybody to respond to the gospel message? But the sad reality there is that there's unproductive soil in the parable of the sower. There's weeds and there's wheat. There's good fish and there's bad fish. This comes back to a very personal, am I a good fish or am I a bad fish? You know that's not, have I done more good things and less bad things? Does that make me a good fish? Does that make me a bad fish? That's not what we're talking about, is it? It's the gospel. Because in the gospel, you can be a good fish. You can be wheat, not weeds. That's great, because again, that final uh, statement there in the, uh, there in the uh, interpretation of the weeds and wheat, the righteous will shine forth like the sun. This isn't a self-righteousness, is it? This isn't a, I've been so good. You know, God is really lucky that I joined his team. I am so smart. I am so handsome. I am so... God is really lucky to have me on side, isn't he? No, that's not... Why are you laughing that I said I was handsome? I'm going to keep my eye on you. That's not how it works, is it? God's not lucky you're on his side. You're lucky that grace is available to get you onto God's side, right? All right, let's wrap it up. We're going to finish Jesus' parables here in uh, 13. Uh, we're going to begin in verse uh, 51, and we're going to go to vi- verse 52. Jesus speaking, have you, he's speaking to the, uh, to the disciples, have you understood all these things? And they say to him, yes. I don't think that this means they understand everything, because as we continue in the gospel, you're going to see that they don't have everything. I think it refers to, have you understand what I've taught you so far? To that, they're saying yes. And that helps me out, because I haven't figured out everything either. Uh, Verse uh, uh, 52, and Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new, and things old. I think we see another parable in what Jesus is saying here. A much more condensed parable, but a parable nonetheless. Now the scribes, as we read the gospel, we encounter the scribes often, don't we? They're usually cast in a negative light, aren't they? Now the scribes, they're a type of teacher of the law, They're the ones that you would go to if you had a question about the law. You're a peasant Jew, I'm a peasant Jew. We don't keep copies of Torah or copies of the prophets at our house. Those are kept in the synagogue or those are kept at the temple. We've memorized parts of them. We were taught them since we went to Hebrew school. But sometimes we have a question. Your ox got out of your your yard and it gored one of my oxes. You know, I swear there's something about that in the law. Let's go find a scribe. He's going to answer. That's what a scribe is, right? But they're often cast in a negative light in the Gospels because they're often coming at Jesus, right? But here, Jesus seems to be rather positive. Any scribe that has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, they've devoted themselves The same way the disciples are devoted to Jesus. This is somebody who's devoted themselves to the kingdom of heaven. They have knowledge of God's revelation, but they're not relying solely on God's revelation, but also on the kingdom of heaven and God being the king of heaven. 
He is like a household. He is like the head of a household. We're going to see the head of a household in several of Jesus' parables. Sometimes the head of the household is God. Sometimes it's Jesus. In this case, the head of the household is just somebody who's in charge of the house. And out of the treasure, out of what he has, he brings out things, some of them old and some of them new. And you might be wondering, is this head of the household having a yard sale? Is that, is that what's going on here? Probably not, huh? Instead, what I think is going on here is a scribe is somebody who has spent time in the Word of God. Not just reading it, but meditating on it, studying it, eating it, getting it into their heart, getting it into their head. But now, they're looking at the new revelation. The revelation through Jesus Christ. And they're going to be able to bring out of the storehouse, out of their treasury, they're going to be able to bring new things as well as old. You'll remember in the book of Acts, Philip goes down to that road that goes to Gaza. And there's that uh, traveling Ethiopian eunuch. And the Holy Spirit says to uh, Philip, go up to the coach. He goes up to the coach and he hears the Ethiopian eunuch reading the scriptures. Does anybody remember where he's reading from? Isaiah. Good job. And he asks the Ethiopian eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? So he has Philip come up into the coach. And where he's reading from that point, Philip is able to take Isaiah and explain Jesus to him. And that is a very Matthew way of looking at the Old Testament. That is a very Matthew way of seeing Jesus, the gospel, in the Old Testament. So not only is this person who studies God's word, not just for head knowledge, but for heart knowledge, they're able to go into the word of God. They're able to see Jesus and they're able to put Jesus into words that will perhaps convert somebody from wheat, excuse me, from weeds to wheat, from bad fish to good fish. And that's something that I think we should all have as our goal. That's something that I think we should all want to be. The Bible is a great book. It's full of good things. Some of these things, even the world will agree with us that those are good ideas or good teachings. You and I know it's more than just a good teaching, right? You and I know that it's more than just nice or moral or something. It goes deeper, right? One of the things I'm thinking about right now is my son. I love it that Bill brought my son up in, in, the, in the communion meditation. And when you all heard his name... You all, I love, I love that noise that you made when, when you, he mentioned J.J. running around here. I feel so great that you guys love having J.J. here because I have to confess, both Christy and I have had that moment of, does anybody think to themselves, he shouldn't be running around in church? Well, then you corral him. He's less than two. You chase him. <laughs> no, I love that, though. I love that you guys love having J.J. here. And I'm thinking to myself, how to get this into J.J.'s head. How to do it in a way that it's going to be helpful to him. How to do it in a way that it's going to help him as he grows. How many of you grew up in the church, but perhaps in a denomination that you didn't get much Bible in your head? I'm going to admit to that. I grew up in a church, and I grew up in a church where the Bible was there, but I didn't get a lot of Bible into my head. A little bit of it, but not a lot of it. How to do that? That's what I'm working on right now because I want JJ to have just that. To have that ability to use the Word of God. Have that ability to use the Word of God when life gets hard, when life gets tough, when temptation comes your way. When life gets tough, when life gets hard, 
Almost everybody probably has Genesis 1-1 memorized. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Great scripture, but is that really going to help you in times of trial? Is that really the scripture you need in your heart, in your head right then? Or are there other scriptures, especially when temptation comes your way? No temptation has seized you, but that which is common to man. And God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But he'll always, he will always provide a way out. That's a much better scripture to have in your head when temptation comes your way, isn't it? Because then you're going, nothing uncommon about this temptation. Everybody comes under temptation. Where's my escape route? Not, where's my, where's my chance to stand up to temptation? How many of you have ever stood up to temptation? The best thing to do with temptation is to get away from temptation, isn't it? JJ, I want you to have this in your head when temptation comes, when doubt comes. That's what I'm working on. That's what I'm thinking about at this time. Are you here this morning and you don't know if you're weed or wheat? You don't know if you're a good fish or a bad fish. Here's the thing. The gospel message, not self-righteousness. I tried to hammer that home, and I'll hammer that home every day, every chance I get. It's not self-righteousness. It's what Jesus has done, right? That's what makes you a good fish, or lack of it is what makes you a bad fish. If you're here this morning, and you don't know that you're a good fish because you don't have Jesus in your heart, Don't leave here this morning without getting Jesus in your heart. You can come up right now. You can wait till after the service and chat with me. You can chat with Bill. You can chat with, you know, any number of people in this church. We want the gospel to go as far and as wide as it possibly can, right? Christian, are you here this morning? Are you here this morning and you're struggling? You're thinking? You're wondering? You're reasoning? I like that I was able to end with this last Matthew parable because I find such encouragement in Matthew's use of the Old Testament. I find such encouragement when I look back at my life in Christ and how very early on I knew very, very little. But now, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, and through all of the investments that people of God have made into me, Well, I'm the one standing up here preaching this morning. Not everybody is ever going to be the preacher, but the purpose of the church is to encourage one another, isn't it? The purpose of the church is to share with one another. You're struggling with this. Well, I was reading in the Psalms this morning this. I was reading in the Proverbs. I was reading in Matthew. I was reading somewhere. We've got to communicate with each other what we're struggling with if we're going to help each other. Isn't that right, church? Isn't that what the church is supposed to be? I've used this analogy, and I'm going to wrap it up here in a second. Go ahead, Worship team, go ahead and come on back up here. I really think that God did not intend us to be marbles. I I really think God intended us to be jelly. You, You think about marbles... And you shoot a marble at another marble and it bounces off. I don't think that that's what God envisioned the church to be. Instead, I think God envisioned the church to be jelly. Because you take grapes and you put them under pressure and you stomp them. And eventually you get jelly. Eventually you get unity. Isn't that a great picture of the church? Let's be standing, singing a hymn of invitation.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you told us the reality of the final judgment. Lord God, none of us know when that's going to happen. But Lord God, like the servants in the story, we have our job to do. Lord God, help us to scatter the seed. Lord God, the seed goes where you would design it. The seed sprouts as you would have it. Lord God, you know the conditions of other people's hearts. We don't know. But Lord God, let us do our part. Let the gospel, that beautiful, sweet gospel message, go as far and as wide as it possibly can. Lord God, we pray for as many people to be wheat on that day and not to be weed. And they need to be changed by your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we pray this all in your precious name. Amen. Well, thank you again for everybody being here this morning. I'm so grateful to look out here and see so many people. And I hope that this message has been uh, uh, good and, and encouraging to you. Let's go ahead and close it out this morning with one final song.